Okay, welcome everybody to today's webinar. Um, I just wanted to quickly go um, over some general things just before we get started. Um, just one note, we're recording this webinar, so please just be aware of that if you're asking questions. And um, yeah, we will circulate the recording afterwards. So if you register to this webinar, you'll receive a recording to your inbox afterwards. Um, if you do have questions for our panelists today during the presentation, um, we do have an option to ask questions. So we did reserve a time slot at the end of the session for open questions. If you have questions, I'll ask you to put them into the Q&A window here in Zoom. If you scroll to the, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button that says Q&A and there's two little speech bubbles. If you click on that, you'll be able to submit your questions and we have time to get to questions at the end. Um, yeah, and we're very excited for today's webinar on procedures for safely returning to the lab. And since the beginning of the year, um, I think everybody experienced a difficult time. And even though now we're still far from the end of the COVID pandemic, um, slowly things are starting to get normal and people are going back to their normal routines. And with this webinar today, we just hope to really provide some um, guidance and just really share experiences and advice for safely returning um, to the labs. And yeah, I hope that everybody enjoys this webinar today. And without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our moderator for today and our host, um, Jen Kemmins. And Jen has served as the executive director for AdGene since 2011. And she got her PhD from Harvard Medical School and she spent 15 years in the pharma industry. And other than that, she's also doing a lot of awesome things in the scientific community. And yeah, without further ado, I'll let Jen take over. Thank you very much, Jen, for hosting this. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm also an advisor for protocols.io, I should mention. So in full disclosure, I have really enjoyed working with this amazing team since the very beginning um, and uh, watching the amazing things that they do. Um, so, well, I guess we should all say thank goodness for online tools. Uh, or we'd be in a very, having, having a very different discussion today. Um, so I'm going to introduce each of the panelists, uh, just quickly tell you what they're doing. And then as we go through those introductions, I'm going to ask them each to talk about the kind of lab that they are, um, that they are currently running, the structure, the size, and how they, how they are operating right now under the new safety conditions to prevent spread of infection, of course. Um, at Adgene, we've been open since the third week of March, third or fourth week of March, as you all hopefully know, um, uh, shipping and distributing and taking a lot of great deposits, uh, coronavirus and other related. So, um, and I would say our team is most grateful for the fact that we were already well-versed in online collaboration. Um, so uh, that's been the biggest boon for our work here. Um, but our lab is working as all these other labs will describe. So I'm gonna start um, by introducing our first uh, panelist, Amansu Stravastava. Um, is a, a faculty position at Harvard in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology where she studies panther worms. And uh, her postdoc was at the Whitehead at MIT, so uh, in our neck of the woods. Um, and she developed uh, banded, banded panther worms from Bermuda, which I think is an awesome place to do research. Um, and they, she's been studying regeneration with this organism and other processes for many years now. Um, so Mansi, tell us about what's going on in your lab, please. Uh, thanks for uh, having me on this panel. Um, so uh, as Joanne mentioned, my lab studies regeneration in a marine organism. So we are wet lab, mostly bench scientists. We do a lot of computational analysis that supports our bench research, but the majority of our work is in the lab. And so coming back to lab was something we took very seriously. Um, and at this point, we are back at low density and uh, where four people go in at a time, we have a two weeks on, two weeks off pod system. So while four people are in lab, uh, working away, wearing masks, uh, uh, separated by at a minimum of three meters or 9.8 feet, um, things are going reasonably well. And then they, uh, once they're done with their work, they can go in at unrestricted hours. Uh, and when they come back home for two weeks, they analyze data, they make figures, and then the other four people in the lab go back, uh, go in uh, to the bench. So that's how we're operating, and ha I'm happy to talk more about that. Great, fantastic. Um, okay, so next I'm going to introduce um, Teresa Jones, 
who is in the Department of Microbiology in the Univers University of Tennessee in Kentucky. I know her from Twitter as Biologist Faye, so um, we welcome her to this forum. Um, she is a doctoral student in the Department of Microbiology, and her research is on uh, vaccine development for toxoplasmosis. So um, the vaccine, knowing what's going on with vaccines is probably both painful and exciting um, right now for her. Uh, so Teresa, tell us what's going on for your work these days as a student. Hi, thank you for having me on this panel as well. Um, well, our lab is a small lab, and since it's shared lab space, most of the labs in those lab spaces are pretty small, and people just come when they need to. For the most part, nobody's in there if they don't need to be, um, which is nice for a bunch of different reasons. So social distancing is easy. Um, in our lab, in, our, in the Sioux lab, we have, um, it's kind of a mix of um, lots of remote work, whether it's the reading and writing, preparing for the science that we don't always love to do. Um, but it's nice to have that time. And then we've got some people who solely focus on cell culture. So they're there when they need to be for that. And then they just go. Um, some people do genetic work, but that's not my area of expertise. So I'm not really sure exactly what they do. But for the most part, they're doing remote work as well. Um, but we're just doing the best we can. Of course, we wear our masks. Um, we keep our distance um, and I think we just we have the understanding that uh, the less contact with anybody the better so. Good to hear that you feel safe because I think that's going to be a, another subject that we'll touch on um, is how people feel. Um, next I would like to introduce Ryan Lieb. Um, Ryan's the director of proteomics for the Stanford University Mass Spectrometry Laboratory known to many of you as SUMS probably. Um, and he uh, uh, developed mass spec analysis for complex mixtures at SRI International, previous to his work there. Um, and he lives in Burlingham, and they enjoy, with his family, eclectic activities like glass blowing, which I had to mention because that is so interesting, um, hosting weekly board game gatherings like many of my geeky friends, um, and some other hobbies that they're keeping busy with during the lockdown. Uh, Ryan, tell us about what's going on at a core facility, which is added challenges, I would say. Yeah, no, thank you, Joanne, for the uh, for the introduction. So, um, you know, we're, we're a mass spectrometry core facility, as, as you mentioned. Uh, a lot of our research, of course, is then very collaborative with a lot of different laboratories. So in our case, we work with around 150 laboratories on campus each year, around 400 to 500 researchers. Uh, and so that covers a lot of contact and a lot of collaborative activities. And when we began our shutdown in mid-March of uh, um, about 120 days ago, um, uh, we had to very quickly come up with a series of systems in which we could keep that collaborative activity ongoing. Um, and so we set about coming up with new protocols, new procedures, and taking advantage of new tools to get communication going. Obviously, we're having this meeting by Zoom. We've been doing a lot of uh, collaborative meetings by Zoom, uh, but we've also been coming up with procedures to have people safely deliver samples to the laboratory, which happens several times a day. Uh, have have people be able to receive their data digitally uh, and so forth. As far as our laboratory and how it's operating, we have about 15 instruments and about 10 scientists, uh, and we work on a shifted schedule. We keep track of calendars to try to minimize overlap and, and maintain distance. Uh, we are in, at Stanford uh, as a whole, we're in what, what's referred to as stage two recovery. Uh, we're lucky enough to have a large enough laboratory space that that means we can have uh, enough of our scientists on site at any given time um, uh, to be able to proceed essentially at full activity, uh, but obviously our collaborators are somewhat constrained by current events. So uh, we, we try to be, make sure that we're in a position to support them any way that we can uh, and have the tools in place already so that as they continue to ramp up, we're there to be able to help. Fantastic. Yeah, Ajin is then in the similar we can kind of track distribution by how the world is uh, doing. And we actually have this chart where we're looking at um, different countries' distribution of materials. And you can see like the lockdowns happen in the, in the curves, you know, it's really, it's really shocking. Um, but I think scientists have, we're seeing an, an increase everywhere, which means people are really trying to get back into the lab. So great. Um, and finally, um, introducing Alice Sarani. She's a faculty at UCLA. She's assistant professor in the division of Hemonc um, at the School of Medicine there. Um, she's also a member of the Johnson Cancer Center and the Molecular Biology Institute. Um, her lab develops organoid, organoid models to develop, investigate rare tumors 
and to perform screenings for precision medicine applications. So Alice, tell us what's going on there. All right, thank you. Thank you, Joanne and Protocols.io for having me today. Um, so yeah, my laboratory at this moment is about 14 people strong. So we are a good group and um, you know, um, we, we closed down very early. Uh, we are a wet lab, and so I decided to close down the lab very early in March before actually UCLA closed down. Um, and then we got back at the beginning of June at a reduced capacity. We were lucky to have enough space so we can accommodate about six people at a time. Um, and, you know, being wet lab scientists for the most part, there are unique challenges, which I'm sure we're going to discuss in terms of, you know, pretty much anything, keep safe, train people, etc. So it has been challenging. And, you know, I also find it interesting that we are having these, um, these events now where Los Angeles is really spiking. So the situation is going from being really under control for a long time to being completely out of control. And so it's a bit unnerving now. Things are changing rapidly and, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, thank you. You know, one of the questions we were supposed to talk about was, um, what stage is your, you know, the city that you're in right now and how, and I, I just think this is now a ridiculous question. Like the, the pace of change is impossible. Right. We have to come up with a way to work regardless of the sort of situation in a way. Um, and so, so let's talk about that really, because um, it really is changing all of the time, but darn it, we're going to get back into the lab, I think is, is what we're hearing from scientists. So, so talk to me about this sort of, um, you know, uh, Monsi mentioned the shift work that they're doing. Um, what types of physical accommodations, and in particular, also, I would say training accommodations. We have a lot of trainees in the lab. Um, what are you doing with, you know, manuals or, um, on, you know, lab manuals or online resources? Like, how are you going about training and working and staying open, you know, right now? Um, I don't know who wants to go first. Brian, why don't you you start? Because I know you have a lot of uh, little sure. details. Sure. No, I'm happy to hop in there. So Stanford put out a uh, research recovery handbook, which uh, a group of us were developing for several weeks, uh, coming up with safe ways to return. It involved a training component as well as a, um, a daily health check component, which people would check in. Um, uh, to a website, they would then provide details about their potential exposure risk and then would be either approved or not to come to campus. Um, uh, so that, that provides a system for contact tracing uh, as well as a system for uh, making sure that people feel comfortable that, that they're coming into the lab safely uh, and that others are doing so as well. Um, and uh, at, at every stage of, uh, Stanford has a, has a uh, effectively a four-stage process in place. Uh, as I mentioned, we're in stage two, which is the third stage. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, at, at every stage, there's different, different activities that are permissible on campus, different uh, degrees of interactivity between scientists and so forth. And so, um, you know, the focus is on maintaining distance and risk uh, and, and mitigating risk. Um, you know, most spaces are constrained based on the size of the space. So in our case, we have constraints of needing at least 250 square feet per person per room uh, and uh, with maximum room occupancies in many, in many locations right now. Um, and then on top of that, there's requirements for masking. Uh, and then um, uh, Stanford is a pretty distributed community uh, with lots of different needs for different types of scientists. And so uh, each department and each group was allowed some degree of freedom to design protocols that work best for them uh, and then implement those protocols publicly. Um, so uh, after those were approved by our environmental health and safety, then, then that's what we've been following. So in our case, you know, for instance, we're, we're used to working in an analytical chemistry laboratory. Most of us work in coats and gloves. That's part of our protocol. Um, and uh, you know, at the, the other part of it for us, of course, is that we're a core facility which has a lot of interaction with scientists and in many cases has scientists come to us to work in our facility. Uh, we've had to curtail that. And so we've had to come up with ways to keep their research moving. Uh, so uh, in our case, we have them drop off samples with us. We then set up those samples and have remote access capabilities on the instruments for them to actually run those samples remotely. Um, and so that was a way for us to keep the uh, location safe uh, for, for our scientists and, and for them as well uh, and, and to minimize the risk of having to close down the laboratory for cleaning procedures or something like that. 
Uh, I, so think, we, I think it's interesting the way as scientists that we can kind of use the science to decide how we're going to make our protocols. You know, where we talk, we know now that masking and gloving and is the right thing to be doing. And so regardless of what your city or country or, you know, we can put protocols in place to make people feel safe. It sounds like that's how you guys have approached it as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and then just based on how that laboratory operates, what kind of interactions are necessary, we don't have cell culture. And so that has a different set of considerations than uh, the sorts of things that we're doing on a typical basis. So it, it really uh, simplifies matters. And then, of course, as part of as part of our recovery, if there's work you can do at home, you do it at home. Uh, so there's there's a, a large amount of our work that even though our whole team has been working uh, the entire uh, closure period, um, uh, you know, many of us still routinely are working from home to to try to make best use of space. Yeah, that's it. I mean, keeping the people safe who have to come in. Um, that's the, you know, that's a really important key. Um, Alice, tell me a little bit about what you guys are um, are doing, because you have a, a heavy, heavy bench load of work that you need to be doing. So Correct. Yes. So, of course, you know, I think like everyone else, if it's data analysis, we do that from home. Uh, but but we we are we rely on our bench work, of course. And so I think also, you know, kind of going back to the um, training situation, we were in this very peculiar, um, you know, phase when the shutdown happened. We had, I think, I believe up I believe four people that joined us just at the time of the shutdown. And so, you know, you have new people in the lab, which you have to train uh, and you can't be close to each other. And so that's been incredibly challenging. Um, and we have come up with a few solutions, which, which are, you know, I'm very proud to say are working better than I um, expected. We have always had, you know, a repository of protocols on a couple of places, including protocols.io, which we, we, of course, keep using, but also I've had you know, the more expert people in the lab record videos of very basic procedures. And it's also interesting because when you do it this way, you, rea you realize all the, you know, little things that you maybe don't think about, but when you are there, you just, in a way, train. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, you know, I forgot to teach this very basic way to use this simple instrument, etc. And so I think it's been a, you know, it's been a learning curve. But now we have a good collection of procedures that people can go back and watch and ask questions. And we use a variety of tools, including Slack, to keep it, yeah. you know, in touch and be able to communicate in real time. Yeah. Um, and so, but, but you know, it, it is a challenge. It yeah. definitely is a challenge. And I think we have to be, uh, you know, as a PI, uh, it, it, it's taking longer, of course, to train yeah. people. And that's yeah. fine. And, um, you know, with all the restrictions that, uh, that we have. But the most important thing is keep people safe. And so that's, you know, the thing that is up there first and foremost. Um, and, and I, you know. I think that instills trust also, like by starting out by closing very quickly and we did the same thing. We just don't know how to do this yet. Go home, you know. Um, I think that was a really important move uh, emotionally for scientists to have the, I, I know there was some, you know, in the beginning, there were a lot of PIs who were like, oh, just keep going in, it's fine. You know, don't stop your work. Um, I'm not saying anyone on this call is is in that situation, but there there were places where that was being reported. Certainly, it was all over Twitter. Um, a lot of anonymous and not so anonymous complaints. Um, I think it really is important in instilling faith that you have safety in mind. That you said to people, "We don't know how to do this yet. Go home." But now we know how, and here's the what we're going to do. You know, so. I think that was a good move on your and, part. And I think you're right. It sends a good message also, you know, to trainees and, and, and students. And, you know, it's okay. We, this is the priority now. We have to deal with these. We're going to be back. We're going to be stronger. It's just a matter of time. So, I love this idea, not even just because we're on a great protocols.io webinar, but of really hammering down um, with video and with better protocols. I, I remi I'm reminded of the year when I was at Abbott when my, my core facility um, had to teach other labs how to make DNA from mouse tails um, back in the day, 20 years ago. And one of the steps said, rinse the pellet. And one lab was just never got any DNA. And we were like, what are they doing? The protocol is so clear. It's, it's, you can't make a mistake. And they never had any DNA. So it turned out that their tech was like taking the tube with the DNA and flicking it into the sink. He was like rinsing it. He was like, like by petting on the DNA and flicking the DNA down the drain a hundred times a day. Like he was just, so we were like, wow, you can't just say rinse the pellet. You need to be more specific. 
So um, anyway, I think having videos is a huge win, uh, which we didn't have access to 20 years ago. So it's great. All right, um, Teresa, tell me a little bit, um, you know, I know you talked about what you're doing, but I know you talked to me a lot about how the school really did make you feel safe um, and putting in, in processes. Um, you know, maybe you want to say a little bit more about that because I think that it wasn't everyone's experience. Yeah, so I feel like they were really quick and really good with sending out another email of like, hey, okay, come in, but maybe not. And then it went from like, don't, you know, um, and it wasn't just the department, but the whole university was very strict, like very quickly, which I was surprised about. Because um, I know sometimes, you know, that doesn't, that's not always the case. Um, and so, yeah, it was really good to know, like, okay, like, it's okay if we don't come into work. It's okay if we, you know, self-isolate or whatever, because this is a big deal. Um, and I will say that the, the department was really good about sending updates um, for phase one of coming back to phase two. Um, and outlining those phases and what they really mean and things like that. Um, so yeah, currently we're in, um, currently we're in phase two. So um, we're just kind of going with the way that things are going. Um, Knox County actually has had a spike in cases. So I think a lot of people are not really sure. We weren't really expecting that. Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's, it's okay. Um, and they give out, they send out surveys every now and then. Um, during phases to, you know, ask for feedback, um, what can be done better uh, for the department, for the university, and what questions or what comments that you have um, directly. So I hope they, um, <laughs> I hope they are responding accordingly. But, but that's, yeah, that's a really good point because I know um, we do a lot of anonymous polling at Agene, so people can really, um, I think there's a lot of things people feel bad about expressing right now, but they are having fears and anxieties and, and concerns. Um, and so asking you how you guys are feeling, that's a great, that's a great way to handle that, I think. Yeah. Maybe. Great. Um, so Monsi, finally, um, uh, you know, what other physical things have you guys done? Um, and, you know, what are the main challenges that you're facing, I think, at this point? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I would say that uh, what's been really neat um, is to get a very consistent message from university leadership that health and safety come first. So Harvard shut down even before the state decided to. Um, and, uh, you know, throughout the leadership had been in touch with us. And weeks ahead of reentry, they shared a document with us that was a set of guiding principles. Again, not directives, because they recognize that every lab space and every type of researcher is going to work under slightly different circumstances. So they shared with us this graph, which I, I think was so valuable, which plots distance between people and time of interaction. And then right. the curves indicate what is a safe, uh, you know, what's the safe area and what is an unsafe area in terms of, uh, by taking into account the rate at which droplets and aerosol spreads through the air, right? And so they, they didn't specify, uh, you know, uh, they didn't control every single thing. So what we had to do as a lab was take the guidelines from the university and my group came up together with uh, a document that it, uh, holds our protocols for safe reentry. So in addition to maintaining distancing and having masks, we implemented robust protocols on cleaning of shared equipment and um, you know, set out a clear uh, list of expectations. Uh, we put HEPA filters in small rooms with microscopy where we don't allow more than one person to be present um, at a time. And we also uh, account for some separation in time when b before the next person can come in so that the air can clear, et cetera. So we actually put all of those protocols on protocols.io. So if people wanted to take a look, uh, they can. And, and we basically, I think it's important to recognize that what works for one lab is not necessarily what's going to work for another. And so what was super important was for my group to have a community agreement on what we were going to agree to do together to keep each other safe. And I think, uh, you know, it's been working reasonably well. I think generally people feel safe. We also, I did an anonymous survey um, for my lab members to get a sense for whether they were feeling ready for coming back. Um, and I think uh, definitely the community defined protocols actually made people feel safer. And generally the feedback is positive. I would say in answer to your question about challenges, I think training is going to be a challenge. Uh, we actually decided to hold off on bringing back 
newer lab members and they're focusing on more computational work at home while we figure out more robust protocols on how to do training safely. Um, and I think the longer term challenge, I think, is going to be uh, continuing to keep a sense of community when people are, for the foreseeable future, going to continue working in a low density framework. So that's a, uh, uh, that's a great segue. Um, you know, I, I, I've done so much training of scientists as managers. And as you know, scientists usually become managers of labs without any training to what that is like. Um, and, and unfortunately, and that's a whole system that could probably change a lot. Um, but here you are all, you and every other PEI in the world, essentially now has to be the best manager in the world. Um, and so, you know, how are you leading um, from a management perspective, as in keeping a culture and a communication going, like what tips and tricks and, and how have you approached this emotional aspect of the lab um, unification? And I just wanted to say thank you for your questions and comments. I will get to the questions in a second. You can keep putting them in the question um, box. So let's talk about this emotional people component. Who wants to go first? <laughs> well, I guess I guess it's kind of my turn. So I, I'll go ahead and hop in first. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we like a lot of laboratories have a weekly group meeting. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we've got a large community of researchers we work with. And so going into this, um, we're a close knit group. We get along well with ourselves with, within our own group, uh, but then have a lot of collaborators who are routinely dropping in uh, and visiting with us. Um, and so, you know, it was important just to try to keep both of those kind of avenues available and give people an opportunity to, um, you know, ask those kind of dropping questions and then also keep keep morale up within our group. Uh, so we've we established right from the onset uh, having lunches together. Uh, so pretty much every lunch we would have an hour uh, where we get together. Maybe we talk about something going on in the laboratory. Maybe we talk about something going on in the world. A lot of times we just play a game of Pictionary uh, and, and cook our food. So um, just other ways to make sure that people are doing well. And, um, you know, you can see the research output. That's easy enough to see that people are, you know, generating data, generating um, write-ups on documents. But this allows you to really uh, have access to how people are doing. Uh, and then in parallel with that, we set up a system of uh, weekly webinars uh, similar to this. Uh, so we have uh, every Thursday at lunchtime, we would devote that lunch to um, talking about something either important in a laboratory, maybe a procedure that we routinely do, or type of sample and, and kind of uh, the basics how to do that, um, uh, sample preparation, um, and, and just really reach out to our community and start talking about things, um, frankly, that we've been wanting to talk about for a long time. So these were often topics that uh, we hadn't set aside the time to record a webinar, uh, you know, a training series on how to do this or a, uh, or a fundamentals talk on a particular common issue that uh, several of our collaborators face. And this gave us a nice avenue to do that and then get real-time feedback uh, from, from our community. So uh, we really used both of those mechanisms to try to keep people engaged um, and uh, make sure that, you know, even if we're more remote than usual, uh, that, that we're still able to communicate with each other. Great, wonderful. Um, yeah, it's, you have to take some pretty active, you have to be active in this, I think, is, is the message. Who? Um, uh, anybody else want to bite this one off or should yeah, I? Yeah, I, I, I can, you know, maybe I keep going on this line. And, you know, I think it's interesting because emotionally there were different challenges when we shut down as when we are back now. The shutdown was honestly very, um, you know, I guess, draining and exhausting from the PI standpoint. It was hard to support everyone when there was so much uncertainty and so much, um, you know, uh, we really didn't know what was going to happen or when, you know, if at all, we, we could be back. And so that part and supporting everyone and making everyone feel like, you know, they can use their time and, and you know, it's not a waste of time and, and they can take actually time off if they need it. That was that was something. And then, and then since we're back, um, um, so, you know, at the beginning, as soon as we got back, I think there was a lot of like general happiness of people being able to, even if at a distance, you know, see other people, <laughs> you know, and, and interact, you know, if you are six or eight feet away, you can still talk to each other. And so I, I think that part was, um, 
you know, I, I really think the morale of the lab was, was in, you know, we were in such a good place when we got back. And, and you know, as we keep going, um, I think there are different challenges. So as you know, you know, right now we are in a um, tricky situation, coronavirus wise in Los Angeles. And so we have to keep that in mind. And also I think, you know, um, we have very good rules, right? We have, you know, people masked, we have people separated, we uh, clean things, you know, we, so this is all in place, but also I do feel that we have to keep a very close eye on, you know, people being uh, just complacent, you know, just starting to uh, mingle a little more than it should be. And so um, policing that, it's, um, uh, you know, it's uh, not, not policing, but, but you know what I mean, we have to keep an eye yeah. on that and, and we have to help our people make, you know, good decisions and keep everyone safe. And so, um, and so that's, that's also a challenge at this time. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is absolutely right. I, I know it, um, there's actually a question here I'm going to answer because it kind of fits in well with what we're talking about. Um, so someone asked a question, um, some people are at higher risk or have high risk family members. Um, the question is, do they get the option of working from home? And what are we going to do? What are we all going to do about people with kids who don't go back to school, um, which is a huge problem. So um, I guess one thing I've noticed about this is that every individual has a different crisis they're facing. Um, I don't have kids at home, but I have parents in Florida. I'm extremely worried about them. My mother's having surgery in two weeks. You know, I can't go there. Um, everybody has their own personal um, thing that's stressful for them. Um, and so there are these individual situations. At Agene, we've, for people that don't have to come in, they can stay home as long as they want to stay home. Um, I don't, the people with kids are, are miracle workers. They're fitting in their work. Um, we're just being extremely flexible about when things get done and very open about the challenge. So if I'm in a call with someone and their kid starts crying, I'm like, we'll talk later, you know, um, go ahead. Because you have to deal with those things, you know. Um, I'd be interested to hear for bunch of scientists doing research, um, how are, are you guys finding ways to accommodate this? I think this is really tough. Monsi, are you faced with, you must be faced with this. You're home with your family, right? So right. We, uh, we had our second uh, daughter born a day before Harvard shut down. So <laughs> <laughs> I had my own set of challenges to. Wow. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, you know, I think definitely having young kids myself at home um, maybe uh, predisposes me to be thinking a lot about people in my lab who have children. But also, I have to remind myself that people who don't have children have other challenges, like you said, parents yeah. they're worried about, or big family events that you know they can't go for, or they do have to travel for, etc. Um, so I think you know what again helps is that there has been uh, at my institution a general culture that of uh, recognizing that different people have different risks and we have to find ways to accommodate that we cannot have a productivity above all else sort of mentality. Yeah. Uh, this is, you know, a major global event that we're going through. Yeah. And so I think it's obviously going to be, uh, you know, uh, managers and, you know, uh, employees or trainees have to figure this out on a case by case basis. In my lab, actually the two weeks on two weeks off model, is working well because you know the people in the lab who have kids have made arrangements with their spouses on well right. you know when I'm off I'm completely with the kids right uh, or something like that uh, where one of the reasons actually I didn't we didn't go with a shifts per day model is that people would then be required to come in at really odd times um, and that can be particularly challenging if you're always missing the morning time with kids or always missing bed time or something like that yeah absolutely so we yeah. opted for a model that allows people regular work days uh over one that would uh, force them to choose weird times and i would be remiss for anyone who knows me if i didn't mention um every parent has this burden but of course this is falling more on women because that's what we do um and and uh, i know that we have many many uh, male pis who are fully engaged in suffering as much but the majority of people who will suffer are women um and so we really have to watch out for that we finally made progress and then you know um it's really going to be hard so everybody has to engage in in, in the most flexibility um do you so i'm going to ask a question for Teresa because there, there's another great question that that segues well but i'd like you guys to think about do we need to change the structure of the education system in a way to be more flexible? Like, what would you, what are you going to do if experiments are required to pass your qualifiers and they can't do them? I mean, 
let's think about that and answer that. But first, I want to um, give this good question for you, Teresa. Um, you know, a lot, you're probably going to be expected to TA or train other students in addition to your own research. And I know we talked about that earlier. Um, one of the pers um, one person asks, how are you preparing yourself for that? Um, do you have the tools you need? Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> um, inquiring minds want to know, I think. Um, so yeah, so I am TAing this, um, I am TAing, I don't know what class I'm TAing, but usually since I am a micro TA, it's going to be a lab. And from what I'm told, labs are um, <clears throat> capped at 20 students, which is like, okay, that's not too many students, but lab rooms aren't that big. So yeah, that's 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 the other issue was like, okay, well, okay, I'm going to wait on this. And so we've had this virtual teaching camp um, where they've kind of taught us how to, you know, set up your Canvas classroom as best as you can, how to do a large lecture on Zoom. Um, so those kind of things are very, um, very useful. How yeah. to uh, go about with doing assignments and grading and assessments and all of that um, so it's really nice and then even then they have other asynchronous uh, workshops and modules in canvas um, about classroom culture like uh, they even touched on uh, microaggression cultural awareness which I thought was really good because um, that's something I've definitely been uh, talking about since I've been well probably since high school that kind of thing has always been so important to me but in terms of TAing as a um, graduate student for the sake of COVID I do think oh where did it go I saw the question Let me oh see. I, I think oh, the I, question was are you getting any support yeah yeah, yeah. Well, I definitely think so I think um mm -hmm. as much information as we can oh they also um they provide well they require a self-screening to be done um I pulled up the little page here just to kind of show briefly the little questions that they'll ask and so yeah. you just go through the little questionnaire and ask if you've been in contact with anybody for the last two weeks what's your temperature that kind of thing and you need it before you you have to submit it and it goes to your email and then your pi gets that same email uh, before you go in so there's that awareness of like um and then that accountability i think which is really important it's not enough to just okay. you know walk in i'm fine you know that kind of accountability is there um lots of communication communication is great i will say um now, the one thing they did suggest uh, having these like face shields. And so luckily the university is providing face shields for whoever you just have to go and email and request it and you can go pick it up. I think one problem though is I don't really feel like face shields are, um, I don't really see what they're protecting. I know like your face, like your eyes and that kind of thing, but there's so much space, open space. <laughs> and so for teaching, I was like a little, I was a little confused. Um, but I did find that they sell masks for people who do teach or people who have to, um, you know, cater to those who are, um, who are deaf. So I think it's really nice. They, um, they have these little clear kind of uh, windows for your mouth so you can still see them. Right. So um, I think just kind of on my own and then other people wanting to find different ways to go ahead and tackle certain issues the best they can. Um, I think in addition to uh, the support yeah. and help we are getting from the university. Um, I actually would think this sounds like you're getting almost more training than most TAs usually get. Cause I know I got nothing. I got like, here's the, here's your professor, the course that you're TAing for, <laughs> you know, maybe it's changed. That was a long time ago at Harvard, but, but um, you know, in a way, perhaps this is just the way that Alice mentioned creating, putting processes in place that we've really needed for a long time. Um, like, wouldn't it be fantastic if for the last years, last 10 years, all the TAs were taught about microaggressions? That has not been happening in the world. Um, it's great that we're starting to think about um, training more, uh, more holistically, I think. Um, that's fantastic. Um, all right, great. Um, did I miss anybody who wanted to chime in on this issue of emotional, um, you know, support and management support? Because we have some good questions coming as well. Um, okay, so um, one, one person had a question. Um, I think we talked about this in our pre-call. Um, if we have any suggestions for interacting with clinical research um, and clinical research capitals. Ryan, I think it was you that has an interaction with the hospital uh, uh, people, yeah. is that right? Yeah, so, so roughly uh, three quarters of our research comes through Stanford University Hospital. Uh, and so, um, the school of medicine uh, and, and a lot of clinical related samples do come into uh, come into our facility. Um, you know, we are a we are a basic uh, research facility. We we follow um, you know, universal precautions. We're not a, a BSL rated uh, laboratory, 
Um, so we aren't typically working directly with uh, clinical questions, but a lot of our samples come from a clinical source. Uh, and so, um, you know, where we are on it, uh, we don't tend to have clinical participants, uh, you know, coming to our laboratory, things like that. Uh, a lot of our research collaborators, though, do, and it has been uh, quite a challenge to figure out how best to do that. For instance, one of the other core facilities we work closely with uh, runs a imaging facility uh, for magnetic resonance imaging, uh, and they have a number of very specific protocols about how they clean down uh, the the uh, room and the uh, uh, the magnet and make sure that that space is safe, their their staff is safe. And as you can imagine, necessarily um, that involves close contact. And so they have to undergo more routine screenings. Um, they, they are at higher risk and therefore have to, um, you know, have extra procedures in place to deal with that. I can't speak specifically to it, um, but, but much as in our case, um, there is a big effort to try to essentially write these things down, come up with a agreed upon set of procedures, run these by uh, environmental health and safety and make sure that um, everyone involved in the process knows what is being done. And, and that does two things. One, it, it educates you on, on what, what we're gonna agree on is safe. Uh, and it also gives you some confidence that other people are following the same set of rules. And, and that's really important um, uh, that, you know, when, when you come into a room and you haven't been there uh, earlier in the day and other people were that you can feel confident that it's a clean space that you can that you can operate safely in it and so for us a lot of um, uh, you know even though we're not working directly with clinical patients for the most part um, uh, you know we, we still want to make sure that samples that are coming from the hospital are packaged safely or are handled safely and so that so that we can work with them uh, without putting our staff at risk yeah, that's really important. Um, I think it's interesting to see academic labs evolving toward an SOP culture, if you will. Um, Agene's very academic, but we are very, very professional in our SOPs now, um, in, more all the time, but especially now. In fact, what I put on Protocols IO as a reference was our organizational SOP for operating under COVID-19 conditions, um, you know, because we, and we made people sign off on it. We made everyone read it because I think you all mentioned that, uh, Teresa, you mentioned that accountability. You have to read it and sign off and say, I read this and this is what I'm going to do like your lab packed Monty, if, if you will, you know. Um, so I, I think that these, um, those things are really, um, are gonna benefit in a way. I'm, I'm trying to find some silver linings. This is one, um, more video protocols and more SOPs and more training, uh, more lab manual type information. And, and I think Teresa, in your case, better training for the TAs, which I think is fantastic. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I wanna come back at the very end to that question about what are we gonna need to do going forward for our science trainees? Cause I think that's important, but I wanna answer a few more questions cause there's some good ones here. Um, so I, I think there's some angst I'll share here from an anonymous attendee in Florida, which of course is a hot zone. Um, and they shut down the, the college with no cases for spring term and remain closed for summer but co cases are rising and now they're saying they are gonna open with a 20% capacity. Um, and so um, I think, uh, you know, face masks aside and, to, you know, is it too risky at some point? Like, do you think that labs will have to, is there a situation under which you would tell everyone to go home again? Like, what would that be, um, the situation that, that you would do that? Um, I don't know, uh, Alice, is there a situation where you would just say, go home for a little while, or you think you can work through this in the current, with the current processes? And we are among those places that we may hit that, you know, situation soon. Um, and so, uh, you know, to be honest with you, um, of course, research is considered essential work. And so um, I don't think there would be a mandate to like close down, but, but we are looking at leadership and we are, you know, trying to get feedback in terms of what to do. Um, you know, for, for, for me, what, what I am doing is really reminding everyone to be extra careful and, you know, let everyone know that we are keeping an eye on the situation and we are aware. Um, and, you know, and, and I really think we need to see, but definitely, you know, the situation is out of control. Um, it doesn't benefit anyone if people come in, you know. Uh, these are people that have to leave their homes, that have to maybe take public transportation 
not as much an issue here in Los Angeles, but you know, it's an issue in a lot of places. And so, um, you know, I really think that uh, we have to be open and we, you know, I think UCLA was really good at that. It's like when we put in our re-entry plan, there was a box there where you had to say, you know, what if we shut down again? How long does it take you to say if we shut down? Uh, you know, are you ready to do that? And so, you know, we reopen keeping in mind that we may close down again. And I think we need to be aware of that. And, you know, uh, and if the situation does spiral out of control, I think it's fair to close down again. I think what this, you know, I think what this period really taught us is that um, we can be productive in very weird situations. Um, we can get stuff done from home. We can get very productive work done in a very short span of time in lab. And if we can't, it's okay. <laughs> you know, we are going to make do and we are going to eventually, uh, you know, um, get back. But if, you know, it's like we are at a time where everyone has to do their part. And if our part to contribute to, you know, slowing this down and ending is uh, staying home for a few more weeks, we're going to do that. Yeah. I mean, Monsi, you mentioned that your two weeks on, two week off schedule was actually, think about that, having two weeks to think about your science and do the science communication and write stuff down and maybe send your protocols to protocols IO, maybe send your plasmids to Agene if I might put in a plug, you know. Um, it's a good time when you can do all that work. Um, it almost benefits doing better experiments if you have time to plan and debrief on what you did in the previous time. We've never had, it's a luxury almost um, that we can see in a different way. Yeah. No, yeah. I agree. I think there's, uh, you know, there are definitely silver linings that are gonna come out of this. Um, I think, you know, the way we do research is going to change per, per, in some ways permanently, uh, in some ways for the better. Uh, I do think there is uh, still a sort of heavy emotional toll that a future shutdown takes on our trainees, right? Because, you know, one of the things that Alice said that really resonated with me was this kind of ebb and flow of morale in the lab where, you know, there's excitement about going back, but when you realize that this is going to be the new normal and you worry about the job market, right? I, in some ways, I'm very protected by my circumstances in career stage right now, but my trainees are not, and, and they're looking at their futures and wondering what they're going to be able to do in a year or two. Um, studying a, 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 another shutdown could be a, have a very heavy impact emotionally uh, than the previous one, and I think uh, in, in terms of uh, what would trigger something like that? I think we would just have to rely on our public health experts. That I think me as a, a PI, I am not familiar enough with all of the science that goes behind all of this decision making. So I would definitely be looking at our you know leadership. And then I think in uh, response to the person who asked that question, I think one of the things what we can all do is ask the people who are accountable what measures they have in place, right? Are there contact tracing efforts in place? Is there going to be baseline testing for everyone when they come back to campus and uh, things like that? So we can hold people accountable by asking these tough questions in some way. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Um, that, that segues well into my sort of, um, well, we will take questions at the end, but my final question, what do we need to change about the training environment? We need, you can't spend more than six years in grad school. It's already a long time. We're already spending way too long in the postdoc stage. Publication is taking too long. Everything is too long. Um, so we cannot have it be made longer. Um, do you, are you talking with people about changes to the system, the requirements, the, the, the deliverables, the process of the graduate and postdoctoral training experience? Um, something I, I'm very interested in. Um, and so what it, who wants to go first on that one? Mansi, you had it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I have lots to say. I think some of those, you know, some of the things you pointed out that it takes the burden to publish a paper these days is much higher than it used to be, right? Uh, you know, we go well ab above and beyond what's actually needed to make the statement and journals and reviewers hold us to much higher standards, some of which are a little bit, you know, uh, unnecessary. And I think there's already been a discussion uh, at NIH and training grants that our students need to be able to publish more, but smaller papers. We don't all have to aim for those, you know, big fancy papers and that risk a student's career. So I think those were already in place. And I'm noticing in my experiences with journals uh, during this uh, shutdown that journals are acknowledging that, you know, if they're 
there is enough evidence in this uh, paper in its current form that allows authors to make a reasonable statement, then that should get published instead of asking for you know, review period experiments ad nauseum. And reviewers have been more accommodating. And so I think that, um, you know, uh, I hope that that mentality will uh, stick. And, and it will it be the same for a thesis? Will it be the same for a qualifying paper? I mean, it, a lot of it may need to be on paper and not in the lab or less accomplished in the time, you know? Do you anticipate more generosity there, if you will, flexibility? I think so. I mean, again, I can't speak for all universities and all departments, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, or even all PIs. Uh, I think definitely at our campus, we are having these conversations where we are all being encouraged to re-envision what a student may be able to accomplish, um, you know, given the limitations that exist right now. Yeah. Alice, Ryan, uh, Teresa, what are you experiencing? Are the, you're just starting out, are the demands, um, feel like it's gonna be reasonable for your students? Alice, it looks like you might have a comment. Well, yeah, so I think it's very important in terms of, you know, students and, and their requirements and in terms of PIs, you know, PIs and their promotion process, all these processes, um, reviewing grants, you know, reviewing paper, we do need new standards and, um, you know, and, and some of these standards are going to be better than what we have before. Um, and so, you know, I also think it's important to consider that, you know, um, things, you know, things are changing and, you um, I, I think that's okay. I think we should be very mindful of students. I have two students that are going to have their qualifying just in September. And, you know, there is a lot of um, just reassuring them that we're going to make sure that they are evaluated fairly uh, because they were home for now, you know, six months, yeah. etc. And so there has to be a really clear understanding on, on our end that uh, that changing and so the way we review things no matter what it has to yeah. change yeah. and i really you know i was very vocal about this on twitter too you know the way we review grants that has to change too the way in which we review papers should have always been the same which is you know what's in front of us is a piece of finished work and yeah. so if what's in there doesn't support the conclusion you remove the conclusion but you don't you know as a reviewer you cannot make that that paper your paper right you cannot you know right. um, decide how you wish it was and you know put in the experiments you want to see you really need to judge what's in front of you yeah and so i really hope you know some of these teaches us that those are actually good practices and, and we need to keep with that excellent um yeah, I mean, I, I think it, we would benefit from, uh, Monsi, you mentioned it's up to every PI, but I think we would benefit, this is my personal crusade, uh, through working with organizations like PD Hub and other organizations, we could use some standards um, that come from on high uh, for people who are funded to have students. Um, and I hopefully, because this group is all understanding the human component, but I don't think that is 100% universal. Um, so, I um, mean, actually, one of the questions is about um, how much flexibility have you had to make your own decisions? And I think we sort of answered that already. Your universities are giving you guidelines, but you have a lot of flexibility within the lab um, to make good to to make good protocols. Um, does that does that ring true for for all of you? Yeah. Um, all right. I want to give everybody. Is there anything else you would like to share before we wrap up? Because we're almost out of time. Um, any tips or tricks? I just want to say good luck because uh, Ajin is here watching how hard this is for the scientists. Uh, I want to say kudos to all the labs working on coronavirus because they have rallied around to share their materials and to really solve this problem fast as a community. Um, and that is really awe-inspiring to watch and gives me a lot of hope. Um, and I think if we can keep having these conversations, we will create a research uh, organization and structure that we can still thrive in, perhaps with some silver linings as we've discussed. Um, thank you guys so much. I want to turn it back over to Anita Brelfs from protocols.io, who will uh, talk about um, how, how you can all access this, this uh, webinar after to share it with people. I learned a lot. Thank you guys so much thank for participating. You, thank you, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan, for hosting this. And thank you for our, all of our great panelists. Thank you, Muncie, Teresa, Alice, and Ryan. Thank you so much. This was super informative. And I also learned a lot. And I think everybody who joined us today was also able to 
learn a lot. Um, so we really appreciate you sharing your um, insights and stories with us today. And yeah, so we recorded this webinar and if you did register, you will receive an email probably later today or maybe tomorrow with the recording. And also since this is such an important 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 topic we have set up a community group on protocols.io and i'll put the link to that into the chat so everybody should be able to see that um, and this is really just a space for everybody to meet virtually and just like um, share resources and protocols there are already some protocols from agene in there and muncie's lab has posted some protocols in there and we just want to invite you to join that group and just continue the discussion there and just share resources if you do have things to share and just start discussions. Um, and if you do have any procedures to that you would like to share with the community, um, we do have an internal editorial team that's happy and ready to help you get your protocols on protocols.io. So if you have any procedures that you do want to share, feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to help you get these protocols um, shared with the community because I think it's very important for us to share things and just like collaborate on these procedures. Um, and yeah, you can either reach out to us at info at protocols.io or to me directly at anita at protocols.io. Um, yeah, so that's about it. And I also just before we end this um, webinar today, I wanted to mention that protocols.io offers institutional plans that really allow the institution and your organization to effectively manage your procedures and protocols. And if this is something that um, you think might be interesting for your organization and you would like to learn more of that, also feel free to reach out to either to me directly at anita at protocols.io, that is A-N-I-T-A at protocols.io or at info at protocols.io. But yeah, thank you so much again, Jan and all of our panelists. And thank you for everybody um, to join us today. This is a fun webinar. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.